in this penultimate lesson on Congress, it feels like um, it's been a very long time we've been talking about Congress. We've been talking about Congress for about two months now, but we're into the penultimate lesson on Congress. We're going to talk about congressional oversight and how Congress oversees and um, holds to account um, different areas of the executive branch. So congressional oversight is a very significant power of Congress. Not just passing legislation, but overseeing the executive is, is one that is seen as a very um, principal um, expression of congressional power. And despite the fact that a provision to explicitly um, oversee the executive branch isn't something that is in the US Constitution, over the years it has become an implied power of Congress. And to carry out the oversight, uh, and the Congress has a number of powers, and some of these powers are very significant. So they have the power to subpoena documents and testimony. They have the power to hold individuals in contempt if they fail to comply with congressional demands. They also make it illegal to lie to Congress under oath. Okay, so they can, so you can perjure, you can perjure yourself in front of Congress in cases of, um, you know, congressional investigations. Another thing that's important is the committee system through Congress. So most of the congressional oversight that we think about takes place through the committee system in Congress. And it also takes place a lot of the time also on the on the Senate floor. But when it comes to the separation of powers within the US constitutional system, unlike the UK Parliament system that we have, there is no fusion of powers with the executive branch and the legislative branch. And this means that um, oversight can't be reduced down to a simple you know uh, congressional question times just like we have parliamentary questions whereas in the uk system the parliament questions the executive um, on a weekly basis you know different members of the executive branch most famous being prime minister's questions on wednesdays this can't exactly happen through congress because the systems and the branches of government are separated we have a separation of powers um, a more distinct separation of powers in the u.s however through the committee systems um, this is where we see a lot of the congressional oversight takes place because you can be called to question uh, on a by a committee panel um, even if you're a member of the executive branch the question really when we're talking about the political debates is whether or not a congressional oversight is effective okay and b if it is effective does is there an argument that congressional oversight does lead to better policy it leads to a good policy better scrutinizing of the executive well generally speaking most theorists argue that congressional oversight is really only effective when congress is controlled by the party opposite to that of the president because we effectively have a two-party system in the united states um, and when congress is controlled by the opposite party to that of the president that's when generally we see the most um, active congressional oversight taking place and there are a couple of arguments to support this okay we're going to look at two two major arguments to support this a from the side of um, congressional oversight being strong when there are opposite parties within power and then on the other side when there are you know when one party controls both the the house senate and the presidency uh, where congressional oversight is 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 really really weak so firstly um almost every single case of senate rejection of presidential appointments has taken place when the senate is of the opposite party so an example of this is um, for example, in 1987, we see the rejection of Ronald Reagan's um, nomination of Robert Bork to the Supreme Court. Again, the Democratic Senate rejected the GOP's nomination of Robert Bork to the Supreme Court. The same can be said in 2016 when Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court didn't even get a hearing in the GOP-controlled Senate. So we can see a lot of um, you know tension between the two systems. And again, in the GOP Senate also rejected Bill Clinton's nomination of uh, Ronnie White to be a federal trial court judge, and they also rejected his nuclear test ban treaty in 1999. So we have three examples here that show that when you have a different party controlling Congress, okay, they are um, much more effective at 
uh, holding the executive to account, okay, and this can be seen through the rejections of uh, potentially unwanted candidates, okay. I'm going to talk specifically about the 2016 case with Merrick Garland when we talk about whether or not too much congressional oversight can actually hamper the, the political process because it leads to um, the branches of government not being able to perform their constitutional duties. We're going to talk about that and use that as an example uh, towards the end of the lesson. The second example that we can talk about when we talk about um, effectiveness of congressional oversight, we can talk about the Bush administration and the way in which congressional oversight was effectively non-existent in cases where the party and uh, controlled both the Senate, uh, the House and um, and the presidency. So between 2001 and 2006, with the ex small exemption of a 18-month a, a period in 2001 to 2002, um, where they had only one vote, uh, a single party vote, the GOP controlled Congress and the presidency. And so if we combine that with the approval ratings and the incredibly high popularity of the Bush administration um, following the uh, September 11th attack, attacks, we'll say, there were more than one, um, we see that um, there was effectively no congressional oversight during this period, partly because of the genuine popularity of the president following, um, you know, one of the most significant terrorist attacks in history, and partly because of the fact that the GOP controlled both the Congress and the presidency. And so we see effectively no um, cases of um, congressional oversight. However, following the defeat of the GOP in the 2006 midterms, we see congressional oversight actions increasing massively. So we can take from this example, this period of time between 2001 and just following 2006, we can see an example of congressional oversight um, correlating with the relative um, power control between the Houses of Congress and the Presidency. Okay, And we can also factor in the uh, approval ratings of the President himself when it comes to um, you know, responses to terrorist attacks. Effectively um, bolstering our... Um, bolstering our evidence that the congressional oversight is only really effective in cases where cases where the party is controlled um, by uh, sorry where congress is controlled by the opposite party to that of the presidency so one argument for um, congress uh, for uh, advocating for uh, you know a healthy amount of congressional oversight is that congressional oversight leads to good policy so some legal and political theorists have argued that in recent years, the act of congressional oversight leads to better legislation and better policy because it, it allows for better scrutinizing of these um, of these policies. So according to congressional scholars Norman Allstein and Thomas Mann, uh, the quote here is that oversight keeps an administration, a presidential administration, on its toes. The lack of oversight and the expectation that there will be no oversight leads to complacency, arrogance and maladministration. So this leads to an interesting political debate to be had. Many argue that a balance ought to be struck between too much and too little oversight. And we can use two examples, really. So where there's too little oversight, um, bad or inconsistent policy, um, you know that the, that's essentially flawed could be passed due to the ideological tendencies of uh, the parties being um, all aligned across the branches of government. However, with too much congressional oversight, the divisions could lead to branches of government not being able to perform their constitutional duties. And bringing back the example of Merrick Garland in 2016, when Obama, um, when Obama appointed Merrick Garland. It's effectively the constitutional duty of the Senate to at least hear the um, to you know to hear and to and to um, ratify or to not ratify whether or not Merrick Garland uh, deserves a seat on the Supreme Court. However, it was the 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 you could argue that with the too much congress the too much partisan politics and the congressional oversight that took place there, they didn't even um, allow Merrick Garland to be to to have a fair shake effectively in. And they kept that seat open for over a year. 
And you could even argue that the 2018 government shut down um, against the Trump administration following um, financial obligations regarding the, the building of his um, border wall. You could argue that that was an example of too much congressional oversight because the divisions and the partisan politics between the, the Democratic House in 2018 and the um, Republican Trump administration led to effectively the government shutting down and not being able to um, ratify the budget. So you have this um, balance that ought to be struck where you have a, just a healthy amount of oversight that takes place within politics and not too much where it leads to a breaking down of the constitutional roles that each of these branches play, but also not too little where um, inconsistent and um, you know overly um, flawed uh, policy can be passed. In the next lesson and the final lesson, we're going to talk about the relationship and the, the, the similarities and differences between uh, the UK parliamentary system and the US congressional system, because that's important when we're going to be talking about uh, comparative politics, comparing the two systems with each other. Before we move on to a, a finally a new chapter, which will be um, looking at the executive branch.